everyone, and welcome to Occupational Therapy 236. This lecture is on executive function and practice with youth. My name is Melissa Kay, and I'm your instructor. Let's get started. We have two objectives for today. Our first is to define basic terms that are related to executive function, which we will also refer to as EF. Our second objective is to explain the role of OT in fostering EF skills with youth. We're going to start with some terminology that's going to help us with, with language and, and uh, identifying the sorts of things that we would be looking for in working with youth who have executive function issues. To start with, a pretty common term, cognition, which is the mental ability to acquire knowledge. Now, cognition can be broken down into a number of different subclassifications, including attention, memory, awareness, and reasoning. Cognition also includes the ability to gain, retain, or remember, and use information, hopefully on demand. Our next term, metacognition, is often referred to as thinking about thinking. So it is how a person examines knowledge and their awareness of what they know and what they don't know. This could be uh, uh, demonstrated um, with you coming into a class on OT uh, with youth, right? So you come in, you have some knowledge because you have been through your youth and some of you are at the very tail end of that. Um, <clears throat> and you have an awareness that maybe you don't know a lot of theory about youth, for example, or um, the ins and outs of work or other um, kinds of skills for youth with disabilities. So Metacognition is this idea of sort of an overarching umbrella about what you might know and not know. The second piece about metacognition is that it helps match skills to the task and use strategies to aid in acquiring information. So an example of this might be note-taking. Uh, I just had a student in class last week say that she was switching from taking notes with paper and pencil or on computer um, typing to using a flashcard program so that when she put her bits of information in the flashcard program, she would be all ready to study. So this requires metacognition about um, what are my skills? How do I best learn? How do I best work? What's a good workflow for me? And then matching that to um, the acquiring of information. Another example of it is reading expressions to a, determine your quote unquote approach. So say that you're, um, that you're walking down the street and um, you see a person who is um, very angry. Um, chances are uh, most of us, sadly or not, um, kind of skirt around that person and we don't approach um, very closely. Contrast that with you're walking down the street and you see a person who's smiling broadly at you. Now, as long as they're not smiling in an in a insane, maniacal way, you're more likely to, um, to stick pretty close to them or to return their smile. So metacognition helps us with these ideas of thinking about how we're thinking about various topics. Our next term, conation, is the mental faculty of purpose, desire, or will to perform an action. It also is commonly referred to as our volition, our cognitive volition. And we know from MOHO that volition has to do with our motivation to act, right? So this is the mental part of our, of our purpose in acting or our desire or motivation to act. Next, we're going to look just briefly at memory. And memory is a, is a huge topic, and we our understanding about memory is evolving, right? So memory uh, is defined as the ability to retain information for use at a later time. We have a variety of types of information, and we have different kinds of uh, storage systems that retain information for different periods of time. So let's look at that first. 
We have sensory memory, so the information coming in through our eyes, our ears, our skin, our proprioceptive system, and that information is kept for a very short period of time. The next system, working memory, which is sometimes referred to as short-term memory, has a capacity of about five to seven bits of information at a time, and we can retain that information for about 20 to 30 seconds. If we don't use the information or in somehow process it into long-term memory, the working memory lets go of it and you have no idea what it was that you heard and remembered in the first place. We can unfortunately take lectures as, um, as one example of that, where you only have a capacity to take in a certain amount of information at a time. You only keep it for a little period of time. And so the instructor's challenge and also the learner's challenge is to figure out how to put that information into use so that it actually migrates into long-term memory. Um, for my uh, doctoral research and throughout my doctoral studies, I, I looked a lot at short-term memory and, and how we can maximize the capacity of, of uh, short-term memory or working memory um, through a, a variety of, of different strategies. So if you're interested in that, just let me know and I'll be happy to talk to, with you more about it. The last kind of memory storage spot that we have is long-term memory. And theoretical, long, theoretically speaking, long-term memory is limitless, right? We have a vast capacity for long-term memory. Now, whether we can retrieve information from long-term memory to actually use is another story, but the capacity of our long-term memory is vast. We also have different types of memory. So the three that I'm gonna bring your attention to here, and, and by no means is this a comprehensive discussion of memory, it's scratching the surface within the, um, the realm and the overarching topic of executive functioning. So our first type of memory is episodic, and that is one's memory of things that have happened to them, right? So it's personal, and it's based on the word episode. And when things get into episodic memory, um, we remember them down the road because it happened to us, right? And it was an event. Contrast that with procedural memory, and our root word here is procedure, and how I remember it is that a procedure is a series of steps, right? So our procedural memory is our ability to remember sequences of steps to engage in various tasks, activities, or occupations. Very different than episodic, which happens to me and I remember it. This is um, potentially, we think, one step is triggered by the next step, by the next step, by the next step. Um, The last type, and then I'll talk a little bit about when memory is damaged. The last type of memory that we're going to look at today is semantic memory. And semantic memory refers to one particular portion of long-term memory that processes ideas and concepts that are not drawn from personal experience. So not the same as episodic, it's kind of the opposite. And it includes things that are common knowledge, like the names of colors, the sounds of letters, capitals of countries, um, and other basic facts that we acquire over a period of time. So it's our facts and figures memory, and it's quite important for students, right? When someone has a uh, for example, a traumatic brain injury or another um, condition that impacts their memory, they may remember things from very far away and not have great um, working memory or short-term memory. They might remember the procedures for things, but they don't remember the facts about something. So we bring up all of these different kind of storage facilities and types of memory because if someone was to have uh, a brain injury, a stroke, uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, et cetera, their memory would um, potentially suffer and it can suffer in a number of different ways. All right, so executive functioning. Executive functioning is 
the higher order cognitive processes that we engage in as humans. It includes the ability to plan, to execute, and to modify our actions in response to demands from the environment. We assess the results of our actions, and then we modify or we alter them moving forward. It is linked to the maturation of the frontal prefrontal cortex in the frontal lobe, and it's involved with decision-making and problem-solving to a large extent, and it's not fully developed until late adolescence. Now, for, uh, for kids, you know, when they're younger than, say, about seven or eight years old, they're really governed by their motor and their sensory systems, even if they're out of Piaget's sensory motor phase, right? They're very, very um, motivated and, um, and kind of geared towards um, their bodies and what's happening with their bodies. From eight through late adolescence, um, we start to see that decision making, uh, problem solving, organization of self and belongings, all of these sorts of things start becoming possible for individuals. And it, it opens up huge vistas for what kids can learn and how they can learn and also how they process information. Um, the maturation of the prefrontal cortex also enables individuals to solve problems in a novel manner. So if we think about problem solving for a minute, uh, and let's just take the example of a puzzle, okay? So when kids are small, once they become interested in puzzles, first it's the, the kind of inset puzzles where you have a wooden board with some holes of different shapes, and then you have um, puzzle pieces that are also wooden that might have little handles on them. And what we see young children doing is trying the piece everywhere, right? So this is called trial and error problem solving, and it's not very efficient. As children mature, they start to uh, engage in more sophisticated means of solving problems and they use reasoning. So both inductive and deductive reasoning. So rather than just trying the piece in all the holes, what they'll do is they'll look at that piece and they'll say, hmm, and this is happening subconsciously, they're not actually talking aloud. They'll say, huh, what is this shape? Well, if there's three or four different um, possibilities for something that is roundish, they might then look at the color of the piece or what the picture is on the piece and match it to what's going on on the puzzle. Same thing with jigsaw puzzles, right? If we can't narrow down our field of possibilities by the shape, then we go to, does it have a flat edge, meaning that it's an edge piece? Does it uh, conform to a certain color scheme? What are the gradients of color, right? What is the intensity of the piece? Is there anything that could be put together with other pieces? So we get more and more sophisticated with our problem solving and executive function is a piece of that. Individuals with deficits in executive functioning frequently have trouble with foundational educational skills like planning and organizing a task, engaging in a task under unfamiliar circumstances. Um, so in other words, they might be able to do a task at home, but if you change the, the environment or if you change the demands of the task slightly or give them like um, similar supplies, but not exactly the same. Like for example, they're doing it with a pencil and now you've given them a marker. Um, they will have a more difficult time generalizing to this new set of circumstances. And people with executive function deficits also have difficulty evaluating the effectiveness of task completion. So they have a hard time figuring out, was I successful? How did I do? And by extension, how do I modify or monitor, monitor or modify my performance moving forward? Think of the influence of executive function skills on clients um, as we go through the semester and we start talking about um, the case studies of various individual um, youths. All right, so we have two different uh, classifications of executive functioning. 
The first is Cool EF, and it is the analytical abilities needed for, uh, for addressing abstract problems. So it's often used when decisions don't have personal reward or personal stakes or an emotional component associated with them, such as remembering a series of digits or a string of words. Um, for example, things that might be on an a, a standardized assessment. Hot EF, in contrast, is the social and affective or emotional based aspects of executive functioning. It focuses on this, the social milieu in which executive functioning develops. So we commonly see this during daily decision making um, in the context of being around friends, family, or social situations where emotions and motivation play an important role. So if we contrast these, um, one example that I like to use is has to do with risky decision making. Okay. So uh, imagine that, um, uh, the issue is, um, drinking while driving. And we know using our cool executive functioning, that drinking while driving is a really bad idea. Our reflexes are slowed. Our um, attention is diverted. We, uh, people may be in a blackout and not remember anything or actually even be able to engage with a vehicle. Uh, all sorts of things happen that make it super unsafe to drive, right? That's cool EF, but think about our youth. Okay. So if we add on top of this, don't drink and drive, a huge amount of peer pressure for that individual to get behind the wheel when they've had a couple drinks. We see that decision making can change and it's altered by our emotions, it's altered by the social context, and it's altered by other people. Even though we know intellectually, sometimes we call it, or using our cool executive functioning, that drinking and driving is not a good idea, right? It's a bad idea. Um, but we see teens all the time, as well as adults drinking and driving, despite their knowledge of the danger. So that's hot EF. We're going to change tax now, and we're going to talk about evaluation for, in, uh, executive functioning deficits. When we assess cognitive skills, we do so in a number of different ways. The first is an occupational profile, and we can gather an enormous amount of information through interviewing our client, seeing what they know, seeing how they think about what they know, how can they verbalize what's going on, etc. We also observe the client um, engaged in tasks, and we try to do this with familiar tasks and novel tasks. There's a huge difference if an individual is familiar with the task and they've developed some habituation or some patterning around it versus a novel task where they don't have a store of prior knowledge that they can apply to that task. And remember, I said that it was difficult for individuals who had um, executive functioning issues to actually evaluate their performance or to figure out how to do a task under dis different circumstances. So the performance of novel tasks will help highlight that so that we can see what's going on. It's also beneficial to screen cognitive status while an individual is both in a familiar and an unfamiliar um, environment if possible. Aspects of observation include looking at selective attention and inhibition. So selective attention is when I can attend to this, even though there might be sounds, sights, people, whatever over here, I am still focused on this. And it requires inhibition of the part of my brain that wants to see what's happening over here, right? So I select my attention here and all this can be running around here, yet the inhibitory centers of my brain help tamp down that input so that I can pay attention to this input. 
uh, you know, maturation of the of the brain um, in later childhood and um, in the adolescent years is largely about inhibit inhibiting processes. So when we're super young, we're growing our brain and we're growing the connections, and then we need to um, fine tune. And inhibition is part of that process. We also want to look at how uh, individuals plan, and we've talked about that their initiation and completion of tasks. So there can be difficulty uh, if one has uh, cognitive deficits in the planning of a task, the starting of a task, or the persistence with task and completing the task. So we want to see where the problem lies. Also memory, which we talked about, problem solving and sequencing, which we also touched on, and the ability to self-monitor and self-correct. There's a bunch of questions on the slide deck, and if you reference the presenter notes, you can see some of the questions that we might ask to elicit uh, information in these areas. Our next uh, section, and this is actually our last section, is about intervention. When we think about executive functioning interventions, we know that there's no one single model or technique that fits all circumstances and works kind of head and shoulders above the others. It's more of an eclectic approach based on as much as possible what we can zero in on in terms of our evaluation and then treating those particular aspects of, of executive functioning or, or cognition that are actually um, of issue or, or challenging to the client. We focus again, and this should be um, a little bit of a repeat at this point, we focus on improving problem solving and self-regulation. And self-regulation, just to, um, uh, to d extend our discussion to that, is one's ability to either upregulate or downregulate so that their arousal level, or also known as their alertness level, is a good match for the demands of the environment. So say we have a teen who has, um, who has ADHD, right? And, um, and they swing in energy level and they have swung high. So they're practically bouncing off the walls, but these walls are in their math class and they're supposed to be sitting down and completing some math problems as well as listening to the teacher. So self-regulation would enable that individual to bring themselves back down. So they're lowering their arousal level so that it meets the demands of the math lesson in the classroom. And we want to see how well our clients can self-regulate. They might need to bring themselves up arousal or alertness wise or down, um, and also to sustain their self-regulation over a period of time. We also want to practice the, um, the tasks and activities that we're asking our clients to do and working on with our clients before we enter a real life stressful situation. What we know for people across the board, and this is especially a sensitive area for people who have had, um, who have cognitive deficits or have had brain injuries um, or other kinds of neurological um, insults, is that uh, stress adds a, 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 a layer to their difficulty with engaging in and completing tasks and engaging in executive functioning. It, it goes across the board, but it's exacerbated for folks who have executive functioning issues. Finally, we want to structure therapy to include just right challenges. So you've probably heard this term before, and we could think about um, Jean Ayers, who coined the term uh, with, re with relation to sensory integration therapy. And within that context, the just right challenge is something that is going to actually stimulate and um, and work on the neurological sensory systems and then motor systems um, that will enable that individual to actually change um, change their nervous system, right? So maybe lower the fire the firing um, point or raise the firing point um, 
or to be able to integrate sensation more effectively. So that just right challenge is the activity that pulls it all together in terms of uh, the vigorousness of it, the difficulty of it, and what sensory systems are involved. Now, we also have just right challenges if we think about Vygotsky, right, and the zone of proximal development. So in that context, we have uh, things that are too easy, things that are too hard, and things that are just right. And the zone of proximal development is addressing uh, let's let's meet that client at the place where where the challenge is just right and with some assistance, they can actually master the challenge. So the just right challenge, you might also think about as the Goldilocks, uh, the Goldilocks point, right? So uh, she, um, you know, she visited the three bears and one porridge was too hot and one was too cold and one was just right. Same with the beds and the chairs. One was too hard, too soft, just right. So we're looking to structure therapy to include these just right challenges. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we, um, make use of our activity analysis and we make use of our up and down grading abilities. In terms of treatment strategies, um, we look at environment and task adaptation. So we would, um, potentially put compensatory strategies in place if the person was not uh, capable or in a place of remediation. So we might simplify the task. We might add external organization to help with the focus on the task. Um, We might uh, use memory aids like alarms or timers or lists or um, apps on, on one's smartphone, planners, calendars, things like that. And we may also have social supports. So people who can enter into a situation with the the client and help them to succeed at the task. Further strategies include compensatory thinking. And an example of this is goal management training. So compensatory thinking strategies are um, involved demonstrating the process and facilitating the the client to think through the task. So rather than just running off and doing it, we're actually going to think it, right? Makes sense for cognitive issues. Um, Within goal management training, what we first do is stop, okay? So get your attention. Then we define what is the task or goal. The third step is list out the steps, verbally, maybe writing. The fourth is learn, which includes um, self-assessment of, do I know the steps or do I need to go back? And what are these steps, right? Um, How do I execute them? And then finally is check. And that's the fifth step. So am I doing what I plan to do? So that is a a cognitive compensatory strategy for um, cognitive issues. The other um, approach that I want to introduce you to is something called co-op, and it was developed by occupational therapists. It uses a problem-solving strategy where the youth engages in this four-step process very systematically. So the first step is organizing and coming up with a goal. What is it I want to do? How do I organize myself to get to the start of this task? Then planning the task, which is called planning. Uh, The third step is enacting the plan or doing the thing, right? So now we're actually executing whatever the task or activity is. And the final uh, step is self-monitoring performance and assessing the effectiveness of the plan in meeting the desired goal. So notice how the fourth step kind of encompasses all three of the first three steps, right? Um, Organizing, planning, and doing, and we're checking back. So we're making this a very discrete process where we go, huh, was I effective? Do I need to change something? If I do, what do I need to change? 
And um, just uh, FYI, uh, this uh, approach is, uh, the long name is Cognitive Orientation to Daily Occupational Performance, and it was developed by Palachko and Mandich in 2004. Some other information about the co-op approach, it fosters cognitive strategy use, as you could see through the steps. It's very focused on problem solving, which we know is a key skill. It's used with a variety of executive functioning skills, so it can, it can work for a variety of different clients. It improves the client's ability to analyze their performance, and that's really key, that self-reflective piece, right? And finally, it does in fact increase self-regulation. Please go back through the slide deck and note any questions that you have, and also um, note any comments or areas that you'd like to investigate further, and we will do that when we meet in class. If you're interested in executive functioning or cognition, here are a whole bunch of references for you, and it's a good place to start. And I thank you for your time and attention, and I'll see you in class. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.